Hi, I'm Mike Barsik, a technical principal here at South Face, and we're here to answer some questions. Uh, and this question is one that I've gotten multiple times over the years. Uh, it's a scenario where someone is renovating an older home and they're doing it from the inside. So they're stripping the studs of the plaster or the drywall. And the question is, you know, what are some ways to insulate my walls from the inside during this renovation? So first of all, there are a number of considerations for when you take a home that forever in its past did not have anything in the walls and all of a sudden now you're going to start insulating it. When you, um, when you do pull the plaster or the drywall off, you kind of have a almost once in a lifetime opportunity to make it better. So that's a good thing, but we've got to be very mindful about moisture. So um, the way to think about it is for its life, uh, that home had lots of energy flowing across it because there was no insulation in the wall. And energy flowing across an assembly means drying. So it, it had a lot of drying capability and it might have been getting wet but drying out and not really having a problem. Well, when we start insulating it, all of a sudden that could become a problem. And so it is definitely something that we need to pay attention to. So one of the ways to talk about you know, moisture being our, <laughs> our big killer of buildings uh, is to think about the cladding is, is you know, the, the brick or the uh, horizontal siding or things like that. Um, it's just the veneer finish that you see on the outside. And what we want to have behind that is some sort of a vented gap with a water shedding surface. And we call that a drainage plane. And so it could be a drainage plane behind siding. It, probably one of the most classic examples of this is brick veneer. Um, you know, so that wall is not solid brick most of the time. There are a few older, older homes that are like that, but most homes have brick cladding on the outside of a stud wall. And so if you think about it, brick is very porous. Mortar is very porous. The rain comes down, the wind blows, the brick and mortar get really wet. Then the sun comes out and dries the brick, but it pushes the moisture in it to the back side of it. And yet the wall doesn't rot down. What's the magic? The magic is that, that, that gap, the space behind the back of the cladding and the water shedding surface. And the water shedding surface is, you know, traditionally was felt or tar paper. Um, today it might be house wrap. Uh, and it, it, there are other kinds of sort of spray on weather resistant barriers or water resistant barriers. Um, and it could even be things like the plastic uh, face of a foam board. Um, so there's a lot of surfaces that can act as that. But here you can see examples of, of tar paper. Um, we can do something similar with, uh, uh, you know, horizontal siding, lap siding. We can, our water shedding surface is in this case is a house wrap. We've got furring strips, you'll notice, to create the gap so that when the, the uh, cladding, in this case the siding, is attached to it, there's still a vented cavity behind it. There's some nice little moisture details you can do with insect screening at the bottom so, so no bugs try to nest in that little space. Um, there are even products, if you don't want to use furring strips, there are even products that are designed to sort of, um, you know, it's almost like a, uh, you know, just sort of a, a spacer product that is continuous that you can attach your cladding through. It's got a little give to it, but it, it, it maintains a void behind the cladding. So um, when, you, when you pull the interior finish off and you, you see the inside of the stud cavity, um, some houses, mine in particular, had um, the siding was nailed directly to the studs. There was no sheathing uh, on those. And when you have that situation, you can see that water can easily wick up behind the overlapping of the, of the siding and can get back into that cavity. It could be an air leak, it can be a moisture leak. It's, it's not a good thing. So one, it, when people ask me what to do in that scenario, what I like to, to advocate for is um, first, we're going to use um, a, a small spacer strip, and it could be a quarter of an inch. It could be a half an inch. Um, we're going to sort of glue or attach those into the space. We could use strips of foam board. I really like this sill gasket product. It's cheap. And we would put some vertical strips in there. And then we're going to cut a piece of foam board for each cavity. We're going to put a piece of foam board that exactly fits the cavity. I say exactly. It can be a little on the small side. We're going to end up caulking it in place. 
but this actually makes the rest of the cavity, the side you can see now, an airtight assembly from because we, we've sealed it off. And, and um, then we have a smaller cavity now that we can put a fiberglass bat into. So we typically would say put an R13 bat in there, but now instead of being three and a half inches, let's say it's two and a half or two and three quarters. So our bat is gonna be compressed and I'll show you what that does to the R value in a, in a sense. Let me show you a cutaway of this where, where this was done. Now this particular home, the uh, cavity was a true four inch two by four. It was a really old, you know, old wall assembly back when two by fours really were two inches by four inches. And, um, but you can see the homeowner did exactly what we talked about. He did the vertical furring strips, uh, attached the foam board, and then caulked it into place. So that's all been sealed into place. And then we're gonna put a uh, insulation bat in the remaining cavity. And that's a little mock-up that he did for me right there. You can see how that all goes together. So what do you end up with now that we've, uh, are you suffering from an insulation standpoint? Well, no, not really. It turns out if you have a two by four, three and a half inch wide, and it's got a three and a half inch bat, and you, you get, take up some of that space for this detail, but you still have two and a half inches left, that R13 gets compressed, the R13 bat now becomes an R10. And that R10 plus the R3 of the foam board means your wall assembly is R13 and you've got this beautiful moisture forgiveness path. Fantastic, not bad at all. And again, we've improved the wall considerably. We reduce the risk of moisture failure. So very, very important. The other thing you might encounter if you pull the siding, excuse me, pull the drywall or the plaster is um, it's homes that do have sheathing, but it's usually diagonal one by. So one by means it's three quarter inch thick and it's certainly not airtight. <laughs> so that's a challenge. Now the good news is there's almost always felt or some sort of water shedding surface on the outward side of that. So you can't see the felt, but you, maybe between the cracks you can here. So you could take a foam gun and, or caulk and try to meticulously go in there and seal every one of those joints. But I'm gonna advocate that you do the same thing uh, that we just saw is cut a piece of foam board, fit it in there and caulk the edges. You don't actually have to do the furring strips on this um, because th there's already the, the, sh the uh, felt is on the outward side and you want the furring between the felt and the cladding. So in this situation, you would just put the foam board right up against the, the diagonal sheathing there, caulk it into place. And now you, instead of a, a three and a half inch cavity, you have a three inch cavity. So you're compressing it a little bit. Um, some people have looked at um, doing furring it out with say two by two. So now your two by four becomes a two by six. Basically it turns into a, uh, you know, a five and a half inch deep cavity. And in a five and a half inch deep cavity, you can put a six inch R19, you'll compress it slightly, it'll effectively be R18. You can actually put in an R20 fiberglass bat that's made for a five and a half inch cavity. One of the challenges though, and the other option is you could do continuous insulation on the inside of this and then put your drywall against that and just nail through the foam board and you know, go through the drywall, through the foam board into the studs, that's an option. One of the downsides of adding insulation like that on the inside is in cold climates where the interior wall butts into the exterior wall. It's called a T wall, that, that wall hits this wall. You're not insulating better in that space, potentially. So that could be a weak spot in a, in a cold spot. It's probably not a big risk in a climate zone three like Atlanta, but it could be in colder climates. So, um, here are some, what I thought I'd do is show you some different scenarios of different R values that you can come up with. And um, I'm gonna start off with sort of the, as I mentioned earlier, line number one is a two by six with an R20 in the cavity. And that would meet prescriptive code today. And that would be a U factor, prescriptive code is either R20 in the cavity or a U factor of 0.060 or lower. We want high R values, we want low U factors. That lower is better on U factors. So anything that's 0 0.060 or lower would actually meet prescriptive code. And if you're slightly worse, you could do a trade-off, but, but as long as you're close, it's not gonna be hard to make that. 
You can also see the code allows a prescriptive option of an R13 plus a continuous R5. We see that a lot on, uh, on new construction where you have continuous rigid insulation on the outside. That would give you, if you look at line two, you're gonna get a 0.057 U factor. So both of those are better than the prescriptive code. Um, they're 0.060 is our target and lower is better. By the way, how did I calculate these? I went to this free tool called ResCheck, which is a code compliance tool. You can get it from energycodes.gov and you can put in any assembly and it will give you the U factor. Now, this assembly assumes that you're gonna have drywall on the inside and usually wood sheathing on the outside. So that's already in. All you have to do is tell it the R value that you're actually adding. So in this case, we're adding you know, R13 in the cavity and we're adding continuous R5. Um, if you look at uh, the next assembly I want to talk about is either using an R13 and an R15. That would be a 2x4 cavity. They do make an R15 bat. It's definitely more expensive, um, but it is available. And then a continuous R3.6. Now, why 3.6? Well, it turns out I'm going to jump ahead here a second. There is a, uh, a company that makes a insulated sheathing that is also structural. And there are several companies that make this. One is the Zip system, which has the oriented strand board with the water shedding surface on it. And then on the other side, they make, uh, they, they have it pre-assembled. It's a one inch board, about half inch is foam and half inch is the OSB. Uh, going back to my table here, you can see that those would, if you put R13, you'd be at a 062. If you put R15, you'd be at 058. So you're really close to that target number that we're trying to hit. Um, also, if you're framing new construction, I was just trying to show the impact of a two by four, but on 24 centers, as opposed to a two by four on 16 centers. You can see you get a slight improvement from 077 to 074 if you space your studs on two foot centers instead of 16. Just food for thought. Um, but the standard wall, a lot of people build or what you inherit in essence is a two by four cavity, 16 inch on center. So that's gonna give you an R13 or an R15 and you can see the effective U factor is 077 or 082. Not even close to our target there. So what can you do? Well, um, we talked about gluing foam board in the cavity and then the remaining part, that would, that would probably get you at least an R16. Another option that we like is this hybrid approach, which um, uh, gets you a, you, you're gonna, and I'll show you that in a second, but you're gonna essentially up the insulation in the cavity and still have it be a two by four. And so that can, we can get to a 16 or a 17, and you'll see, we get to 17, we're almost at the 060, we're at 064. So we're getting closer and closer. By the way, um, the, the climate zones I mentioned, uh, this map is uh, in use in the energy codes up until 2018. There's a slightly revised version of this in the 2021 codes, but this dictates you know, sort of where you are depending on what your prescriptive R values are. And we talked about this. Well, here's a strategy that we do like, which is basically um, put in a half inch or one inch of foam board and then, and then put in a less expensive, you know, say fiberglass, rock wool, cotton, open self, I mean, you know, uh, foam. But anyway, th those would get you the sort of uh, less expensive insulation. If you didn't want to use foam board, you could spray one inch of closed cell foam. That's usually going to get you about an R6, R7, and the remaining cavity, let's say a compressed R10, you know, a compressed R13 becomes an R10. So now we're at R17 in our assembly. So the bottom line is we have a lot of options and, and we're paying attention to moisture because remember, now that we've insulated this wall, there's not quite so much drying potential. I'm Mike Barsick. Thank you for listening and hope this is helpful. Mm -hmm.